This is uh, an example for linked lists, and this is the intuition part of the example for that. There are some concepts you need to know about Java, Java before jumping into this example. And uh, the issue here is if we want dynamic storage allocation, that is, we don't know ahead of time how big something is going to be, we could always declare a really huge array for it. But if we, if we want to only allocate the amount of storage that we actually need, then we need something that can grow and shrink as the amount of data we have grows and shrinks. So ArrayList would do this in Java for us. But if we didn't have ArrayList, what could we use? In other programming languages, we don't have ArrayList, or we'd have to build our own. So uh, here we are developing the ideas behind how ArrayList works, and those are the ideas of dynamic memory um, allocation. And in our case, we're building what's called a linked list with that, which are several nodes with our data, with our content on them, and the nodes are linked together. So there's a website where some sample files that are relevant can be found. So if you go to this website, it'll take you um, to a page that looks like this. And then come over here under Notes and Reference and click on Java Notes. And underneath the Java Notes, we want to come down to ArrayList and Linklist. And then under ArrayList and Linklist, this is the example where there's the intuition. And later we'll be seeing these two files for actually the actual Linklist uh, part of it. So, yeah, so we want that example right there. If you want to click on that, open up, and have it available to you, that might be helpful. So the intuition is, uh, let's say that we have a table. And in our table, instead of parallel arrays, we're going to have a class node. And in our class, we've got two instance variables, uh, data and next. And uh, so here's the data part. Here's the next part for each row. So in our case, we're storing letters of the alphabet, and we want to store them in order. So currently, we have A, and then F, G, H, M, P. And uh, we could insert other letters. And when we insert the letters, we want to be able to, to uh, have the letters be inserted in order. So uh, we're going to take a look at insert, inserting the letter B in ascending alphabetical order into our list. And over here, we're going to show the lines of code that would do this, and then later we'll see the general case where this would happen. So line 0, node array of size 10, we declare this array of size 10, that's line 0. Line 1, we say free row is equal to 6, so we have this variable called free row, and that's equal to 6, which is basically pointing to that row, row 6, where things can go. Row 2, uh, line 2 says char letter equals b, so we have this other variable called letter and we store character B into it. Line 3, just a comment, line 4, array sub free row. So we're looking at this right here. Array sub free row, that takes us free, free row 6. So here's our array. Array sub free row takes us to that whole row. And then the, the dot data portion of it gives us this left-hand data portion of it equals letter. So letter gets stored into that. And letter, of course, is character B. So we store a B into this position of the table. So that's line 4. Line 5, same thing, except for it's the dot .next portion of it, which is over here on the right. So the dot .next portion gets the uh, value for 1. So that goes in like that. And then line 6, array sub 0 dot .next. So we go into the array at the 0th row, and then we look at the dot .next portion, and that's up here, the dot .next portion. We're going to change that to be free row, which of course is 6. So we change that to be 6. And then lastly, at line 7, we say free row plus plus. So that becomes 7. In other words, now 6 is no longer the free row. Now this is the next free row if we want to put some additional content in. So we have placed B into, in, in, uh, into the table. And we have updated the index values so that a, after A, the next place we go is to 6, which takes us down here. And 6, then we see the next letter, which is B. And after that, we go to line 1, which takes us up here, right? So 6 takes us down there. And then we go to line 1, which takes us there. And then 2 takes us to the next line, and, and so forth. So after A, we jump to B, then back up to F, G, and then through the list. So um, we could then consider, uh, well, we can take a look at this code right here, which would 
traverse or display the letters in order. So we start out with the value of current is equal to zero. So here's current is equal to zero, which you know again is pointing up here to the, the first row. Let's get rid of these arrows just to make it a little easier for us to see what's going on here. So current is zero and then system out dot print. So uh, Let's keep a list of what our output would be. And so uh, let's call this uh, line 8, line 9, line 10, and line 11. So at line 10, we print out error, array subcurrent. Current is currently 0 dot data. So we're going to print out the A, the first output, and then a space. Then we go to line 11, which is right down here. And then we advance current, so we just go into the row and get this value that's on there, and that becomes a new value for current. So current becomes 6. So that now takes us down here to array at row, um, seventh row, which is index value 6. And we print out what's there, which is the B. And then we take this and make that current. And we just keep going. So now that takes us up to here. We print out the next letter, which is F. And then we go to here, which takes us to this row, print out the next letter, and so forth. We'd get G, H, M, P. And at that point, P after P, we get to negative 1 as the next index, and we hit our ending condition. It is negative 1, so then we exit out, and we're done with this loop. We've printed out the letters in order. So what this gives us is it gives us the ability to put letters into the table, but we're limited by the size of the table. So we need some way to do the same sort of thing in terms of adding elements without the limitations of a fixed table or fixed array size. In order to do that, we uh, are going to uh, write the code a little bit more formally. So we had seen class node up here. And so uh, here again, we have class node down below. We think about what our code would be to create this list right here. So uh, let's assume that we have uh, the get and set methods and code. We would declare a node called uh, p head, which is a pointer to the head of the list, and we we'll say that that is equal to null. And let's make another one temp and let's say that that one uh, I guess that one could start out null as well but that doesn't matter as much and so uh, let's first create this node we'll store the values in it then we'll create the second node and we'll connect it to the existing node and as we go we're going to keep track of the head of the list so we're actually going to start where uh, the head points here and this doesn't even exist we're going to put the elements into it then we'll have ptemp create a new node and update the elements of it and then take our head pointer and up, update it so it now points to this, this next new node. So first thing we do is we say uh, ptemp equals new node. And then we take our node and um, and we're going to set the data portion of it to be the letter D. So we assume that the set and get methods already exist. And then we'll do ptemp.set next to be a null. Actually, instead of null, let's do this to be p head. And let's go ahead and be consistent here. Let's call this set p next. p means pointer. In other programming languages, it's more of an issue for the naming convention. We don't, pointers are hidden from us in Java, but we'll use that same naming convention here. So uh, when we create new node, so, so this is our target, but down below, I'm going to write what happens as we go here. So we've got this thing called uh, um, p head. And it starts out pointing to null, so it's pointing to nothing. And then we also have ptemp. 
and p temp we say equals new node. So we do that. There's our new node. And uh, and then here we say p temp set data to be d. So we put the d in there. And then we set p next to be this value p head, which is null. So we end up doing that. Basically what's happening is whatever the address is in there, we store in there. So we're duplicating that address. And the, that slash, that line, just is a way to represent null. Okay, so we've made the first node. And uh, the, the last thing we need to do is we need to say um, head is equal to p temp, like that. All right, and which means it's not going to be null anymore. Now it's going to point over there. And now we're going to repeat. We'll say p temp equals new node. So when p temp equals new node, that means that this is going to go away, and p temp is going to point over here to a new node. Notice when I say point, it's not pointing to the bottom middle of it. It's the address where the entire node lives. So p temp points to the new node, and then p temp set data. In this case, we're going to set it to be e, and this would normally come from user input. So here goes the E that gets stored there. And P temp dot set P next to be whatever P head is. So head is going to keep track of the head of our list. And currently this is the head of our list. And so what's stored in P head is the address of this node. So the address of that node is going to be stored there, which in other words is like this thing pointing to it like that. And then we say p head equals p temp. So p head used to point over there, but now we're going to make it point to whatever p temp points to. And p temp has the address of this. And so p head no longer is going to point there, but rather it's going to point over here. So now p head points to this first list element, which in turn points to the second one, which in turn points to null. So now we have, in fact, built this list and showed the lines of code to do that. If we look carefully at this, we see that this code and this code is exactly the same. So we can put that code inside of a loop and loop through it, and we can build as many nodes as we want on our list. And each time what we do is we're prepending. We're making a new node, and we put whatever contents goes in here, and then it points to the existing node, and then the head ends up pointing to the beginning of this new list. So that's the mechanism. So next step is going to be to actually develop the code to do this. We'll do it in two steps. We'll first write uh, the code to develop the class. We'll have the get and set methods. We'll have the constructors. We'll have two string for a node. And after that, we'll write the, the code for the linked list class that actually has the loop in it. Each time through the loop, we'll do something like this. And then we can show how then we can traverse the list or use it to do something. One other thing um, that I would like to comment on is these three lines right here. Notice that we're saying new and then setting these two members. So allocating memory with new and then setting members, we can combine these three lines into a constructor. And what that constructor would look like is instead of new node like that, we would say new node, and then we'd send it in the parentheses. I'm, I'm running out of space here just a little bit, but we would send it the letter. We would send it the pointer that we want to have in it. And it would do all three of these lines uh, for us. Hope this makes sense. Do go and take a look at the, this file uh, on that website and uh, make sure you understand this content before we jump off into developing that new code. In this example, we're looking at the code to build a linked list. And uh, what you should know in Java programming before you do this are these various elements. And you should also have gone through the intuition of what we're trying to do when we build a linked list um, before coming to this example. In, in this 
section of the explanation, we're actually going to be writing the code to build a linked list, so taking it a step at a time. If you prefer to go and look at the code already made and don't want to engage with the process, then you can follow the links to the website and look at these two Java files at the node.java and linklist.java. So we're going to be developing the Java code for a single list uh, node, and that's this code right here. And secondly, we're going to be doing the linked list program, which is that right there. We're not going to develop the full thing, but just the principal components. So let's jump over to an Eclipse program and to do these things. So I've got the two classes already declared. I've got node.java and then the linked list class. So we're going to start out with node. And in our node, we're going to have two instance variables. So uh, first of all, we're going to uh, make our linked list to be simple. So the only thing that we're going to have is we're going to have just an integer to be the data part of it. And we're going to have uh, a pointer to the next node. So these two uh, instances. Then uh, here in Eclipse, we can go up to source and we can generate the getters and setters for these things. So let's select all of them generate the getters and setters. So there they are. We can also come down below here and generate two string. Where is it? So we can use this to print things out. And we can get rid of the stuff that we're not really paying attention to. And so we can just return the data part of it. That's really all that we care about. When we display this information. Um, and it has to return since it's int and we want to convert it to a string so we'll take empty string plus the data and that'll convert it to a string and our various getters and setters here and then we also need our constructors so constructors no return type so the default constructor and our default constructor is just going to set the values for data is equal to zero and the pointer to the next node is equal to null and then we have uh, what I call a fully qualified constructor where we're actually going to receive an int to be stored and we're also going to receive a pointer to a node um, so the what should I call this? The p next value, I guess. Not very satisfied with that name. And then here I'd say data equals the data that gets passed in, and the next pointer is equal to the p next value that gets passed in, and that's it. So those are the main pieces. Now, in, in the, so we're going to use this. Now, in the linked list class, now this is where we get to think about it. So I've already put a few things in here for us. So we've got scanner for the keyboard, and we've got main that chains off to do it. And now inside of here, do it, we have a message that says done. But now this is where we have to start keeping track of things for the, the linked list. Uh, so we're going to have uh, the main loop, and what the loop is going to do is it's going to prompt us for the information and when we type in the information some numbers followed by negative one they're going to get stored on the list so the main loop would say while number is not equal to negative one then we're going to do something right so which means that we need to have number declared to store information that's coming in uh, the keyboard is all ready to go here for getting user input and we're going to need a couple generic pointers for manipulating these nodes as well. So I'll say uh, node for the head of the list. Start, start out as null, and we'll have a node for a temporary node. And we could start that out as null as well. Um, and so we start out to number equaling zero, let's say. So we go through in this loop the first time. And we'll say, uh, now let's have a prompt that says, uh, please enter 
numbers to be stored followed by negative 1. Okay, and so here we're going to read in this first number. So we'll say number equals keyboard dot next int. So we read the number in, and now we want to create the first node using this number. So we're going to say, uh, let's get, create a new node. So ptemp equals new node. And now let's store these elements uh, of the number that was just read in into the node, as well as tell it what the pointer should be. And this follows a code from the intuition that we saw previously. So, uh, so ptemp dot set the data part of it is going to be the number that was just read in and ptemp dot set um, p next should be in this case p head which is null the first time and then lastly we'll say p head equals p Next. Now, this code that I've just written will not make much sense to you if you haven't gone through the intuition where we, we talked about what these lines should be and, and dealt with this. So I encourage you to do that if you haven't already. Sorry, this should be p temp. There we go. Um, these three lines right here, the above three lines, could be done simply as in a single line we could say ptemp equals new node and instead of using default constructor we could use a fully qualified constructor and send it number and p head like that but the, the sample for reversing the list uses this notation so i'm going to go ahead and keep that there so this is going to go through and build the list other thing we could do is we could display the list as we go each time. So each time we add a new node, maybe we could display the list and we could send it the, the head pointer to the list. Notice that this is going to be a, it's passed by value, right? So any changes to it do not get reflected back. So it, it shouldn't break anything um, by using that to traverse the list. Display list doesn't exist yet, so we have to write that code, which we can do right down here. So returns nothing, display list, and receives node. We can call it the same thing. And uh, now let's say while p head is not equal to not equal to null, then we want to uh, display the contents of the node, and then we want to uh, advance the node pointer, which in this case is the head of the list. So to display it, because to string is defined, we can just say system dot out dot print line, and we can just send it uh, the node itself. So so that points to the node, and when it is received in the node class that matches on two strings so it's going to print out a space plus the data that's stored at that node and then we want to advance the node pointer which is simply going to be p head equals p head dot and which part of the uh, of the node is it um, it's going to be the get p next part of it which gets the pointer that points to the following node. And then this is going to go through. Again, uh, this is similar to the code that was shown in the intuition. So uh, I, I, I trust that you looked at that already. That made sense to you. Otherwise, it's possible this would not make sense to you. So this is called traversing the list. Traverse the list to display all values on the list. All right. So let's take a look at what happens when we run this code and, and see if it compiles. Uh, we've got our old problem of uh, have to save it. And since it's a new program, we want to say run as Java application. Please enter numbers to be stored followed by a negative 1. So how about uh, 3, 5, 7, and then negative 1.
So each time we go through the list, it's going to print it out. <clears throat> so the first time we printed it out, it printed the three. And then, um, so we're, we're printing these with a uh, print line. So uh, it's a little hard to see what's happening. So let's go in here and make this print. And then after we display the whole list, system.out.print line, we'll do that. And let's try this again. So here's the numbers to be stored. So a three, five, seven, negative one. All right, so here we go. First time through when the three is entered, it makes it puts the three on the front of the list. There it is. Uh, second time through, oh, other thing that's happening is just jamming them together. So we need to come down here in our node.java and we have to put a space in there. So actually, well, let's put it after it. Let's print the number and then put a single space, so it's going to convert it to a string. All right, third time's the charm. Let's see what happens here now. So enter the numbers to be stored, three, five, seven, negative one. All right, so the three is entered, it gets added on the list, it's the only thing on the list. Then when the five is read, that gets prepended to the list right there, and the three still is the tail of the list. And similarly, when the seven is prepended to the list, now we've got the seven at the front, then the five in the middle, the three in the node at the end. And then when the negative one is entered, the negative one is actually getting stored on the list as well. We don't want the negative one on the list, so let's go in and, and fix that. So while number is not equal to negative one, so when we get the next int, we'll say um, if... If number is equal to negative 1, then we'll break out of this loop and not add it. So what's the saying? Fourth time's the charm, right? I think something like that. Here we go. And we see the negative 1 is not getting stored, and we're done. So now we're going to take this code. It's the same code, but it's in the context of a larger program. But uh, the notion of entering information and storing it on the list is the same. It's this right here. In the sample code, we don't display the list each time that we go through. It's just going to create the list. And we're going to think about what we need to do to actually uh, reverse the nodes that are on the list. So now we've seen how to build the linked list. And we've seen sample code to do that. Um, if you go back to the web page, on the web page, reverse.java, this is the code that we're going to be examining now and doing a trace of that. Uh, and you can also see the, the handout uh, version of it with uh, uh, some of the intuition, I think, uh, attached to that. So uh, if you go to the web page, and on the web page, again, do our, uh, go to the site for Java Notes and inside of Java Notes. ArrayList and LinkList. For ArrayList and LinkList, we come in here to reverse.java. So this would show us the code. Um, we could look at the Microsoft Word version of it. And this code shows us how to recursively reverse a linked list. So we'll look at this now in some detail. Running this program would look like what is shown right up here. And here uh, we can see that user input would be the numbers 135 followed by negative 1. So when these are added to the list, what's going to happen, first the 1 is added to the list, and then we'd have a null. And then the 3 would be added to the list. And then lastly, the 5 would be added to the list. And then we'd have our head pointer points to the beginning of the list. And it would look like that. So if we traverse this list, we'd go through the list and print these elements out one by one. We'd have the 5, we'd print out, then the 3, and then the 1. And then when we reach this null, we know that we're done. And so that's all that would print out, the 5, the 3, and the 1, as we see right there. What this code is going to do, it's going to recursively reverse this list. And so what we're going to end up with is we're going to end up with the head pointer on this list pointing to this node here and then we're going to have this last node on the list is going to point that way 
this node is going to point that way. And then this node will be null. So after the list is reversed, if we were to traverse the list, when we follow the head pointer over here, first we'd print out the 1, then the 3, and then the 5, and then the null signals the end of the list. So 1, 3, and 5. And in fact, that's what we see right here. That's the output after the list is reversed. So we need to go through this in some detail and, and see how this is implemented. The, the first, so just an overview of the code that, that we have in front of us. We have a main that chains off and, and starts things going, starts off into main loop, and main loop is over here. And then we have display list, and this is going to traverse the list and display each element in the list. So I'm assuming, again, that from the background information and material, that you're already familiar with how this works. This has a while loop. The while loop goes through and it has a temporary pointer that points to the current node. And while it's not equal to null, we visit that node and we print it out. So this would call the toString method for this particular node. And we can look at the toString method for the node. And the toString method for the node simply prints out the data portion for that node. And, uh, and then we advance the pointer. So the pointer goes from where it currently is, and it changes to get the, the next pointer, because the next pointer is assigned and stored into this current uh, node reference. So that's the mechanism for displaying a list. Again, I assume that you've seen that previously. We're not focusing on that here today. So once we start up inside of main, we prompt uh, for the user input, and we do this in a loop. And so here is this, this loop where we get the user input. In our case up here, our user input was 1, 3, 5, and negative 1. So we reach each number from, in turn from the keyboard. And um, if it's not a negative 1, that is one of the numbers that we want to process. We get a new node on this line. And we have a temporary pointer that points to it. And then we're going to prepend this or insert this at the head of the list. So we store the number that was just read onto into this new node. We connect this node and it make it point to the current head of the list. And then we make this node become the new head of the list. And then we cycle around and get the next number. We continue doing this. And so our input uh, would give us a list as we saw previously uh, up here at the top as a sample. So after the list is read in, we have a linked list and the linked list would look like what we have down below here, where we would have p head is a reference to the beginning of the list, and that node points to the next node, which points to the next node, which then points to null. So that's what we have so far. So when we call display list right here, display list. We're going to go through the code here and display list, and we're going to traverse the list. And as we traverse the list, we would start at the beginning. We'd print out 5, then traverse, then print out 3, then traverse, and print out 1. So that's what we have so far. So assume that we've already done that. Now we come into the code where we're going to start to pay attention in detail where we actually reverse the list. So we start out, first of all, um, that ptemp has been used to build the list, and we keep track, ptemp equals phead, we keep track of the beginning of the list. So let me describe to you the, the pieces of what's going to happen here, and we'll go through this, this explanation in layers. After we, re so we're, we're going to end up reversing the list, and this is going to point here. So what used to be the last one becomes the first one. What used, to become the, what used to be the first one now is the last. And then the last thing we have to do is take this last node and make it null. Otherwise, when we're traversing the list, we go from here to here to here. And if we have not made this null, then we'd go there and then we'd go there. And we'd end up in an infinite loop going back and forth between these. And that's not what we want to do. So we're going to do that traversal. Um, and... The last thing that we're going to do when we come back is to set this null value for the new end of the list. 
and we have to keep track of the head of the old list so that we can do this once we get back. So that's what this p-temp is used for. So let's go ahead and jot that down. p-temp. This is a reference. It's a copy also of what is currently the head of the list and in the end will be the, the end of the, of the new list. Um, so we have done this p-temp right here and now we're about to jump off and call this code. I'm going to use color coding here so I'm going to stick with black at the outer level. So we're about to make this recursive call. Before we do that, though, I want to highlight a single line of code that's in here, which is this line right there. Because when we get to that point, I don't want to have to spend time thinking about it each time when we get there. So this says reverse link is what that does. So let's think about what that line of code does. Let's say that we've got a couple nodes that are connected together. And, um, and let's say that P head currently points to this node and this node connects to the next one. What this code does, it says pHead.getPNext. So pHead.getPNext, the effect of that is getPNext is it dereferences this and, uh, and getPNext is the method that gets this portion which is the address of the next node. So we get the address of the next node. So that is what this portion does so far. We get the address of the next node. Oops. So after we get the address of the next node, the next thing that we have to do, so, so far we've gotten the address of the next node, and now we say set p next. So set p next refers to this node, and it's going to set what is stored in the next pointer portion the p-next portion. And what is it that we store there? Well, what we store there is p-head. All right, let's think about what that looks like in terms of drawing a picture. If we draw a picture of that, I don't know why this keeps jumping down when I do undo, but it does. So we draw a picture of that. What we see is that when we take p head and store that uh, sorry we we uh, we store p head into the set p next portion so p head is going to be stored in there what is p head p head is the address of this node so since it's the address of that node what happens is right here we store the address of that node into this spot so it ends up looking like that so the idea of, of, of this line of code is that it takes the address of the next node and it makes it point back to the current node. So if I have p head pointing at this current node, it take, makes the next one point back to me. So make the next one point back to me, or in other words, it reverses the link. So when we get to that line, I don't have to spend time thinking about that. I just want to remind us that that, in fact, is what it's going to do. All right, so let's jump in now. So over here at line B, we saw that uh, we have p head equals. So we're going to jump off and make this recursive call to reverse list, which is this code up here. And, um, and eventually, the return value is going to store something into p head. In other words, this is going to change, but it's only going to change once we come all the way back out of the recursion. So for now, we have to go in to make this recursive call and then see what happens. So we call reverse list, and the first thing we send it is p head. And p head is the beginning of the list. That's what we have right here. It's the address of this node on the list. So we're going to go in, and the first layer that we catch it, we'll call it the blue layer. So p head gets caught here as a parameter. And so this means that the local copy of this, this parameter is, is called p head. So from the perspective of blue, first recursive call, we have a parameter called pHead, and it is address of the first node, like that. And then we do a declaration here at line 2, node pTemp. So we have another variable called pTemp. So let's jot that down. pTemp, 
And we don't know what that points to currently. It's not assigned to anything. So, uh, so here's P temp. And then we go into line three. This is our base condition for the recursion. And this is only going to trigger when our current pointer's next portion is null. In other words, when this part is null. Well, for us right now, it's not null. It actually has the address of the next node. So the base condition is not true. So we go on into lines five, six, and seven down here. So we get to line five, and here's line five, and we see that there's another recursive call. P temp equals, that is, we're going to store something in there, P temp equals, and in fact, we'll see that each version of, of P temp will have a P temp, P temp as we go here. What they end up being is they end up being the address of the last node, which gets returned into each of these, which in the end then gets returned to set what the new, uh, the new head of the list is. So let's just follow this. So P temp from the perspective of blue equals, and now we have to make this recursive call to reverse list. So we're going to make the recursive call and we're going to send it a pointer. And what is it that we send it? We sent it this thing. And that's p head dot get p next. Okay, so p we're going to send it p head dot get p next, which is this. So p head points to this node, and the dot get p next gives us that portion. That's the address of this node. So that is what we're sending it, the address of that node. That's what's being sent. So we send that address in, and then we catch it as a parameter, and we'll call this layer the green layer. We catch it, and because we catch it, we have another layer of the recursion, and we'll call this one the green layer of the recursion. And that is the address of this node. Note that I'm not pointing to the middle of it, right? When I have an, an arrow pointing to a node, it points to the address of where that whole thing is in memory. And then from the perspective of green, then we have a declaration for node p temp, so we declare a p temp variable from the perspective of green. And there it is. Uh, actually, let me zoom in just a little bit to make this easier to see for us. So here we are from the perspective of green. And base condition is not true, so we go ahead and come down to this line of these lines of code, line five, p temp equals. So we're about to store something in p temp, but we can't finish that assignment until we make this recursive call right there. So we have to finish making this recursive call, and we're going to send it p head dot get p next, which says p head is the address of this node dot get p next, which gets that portion right there which in fact is the address of this last node. That is what we're passing as the parameter. And so green, we make this call from the perspective of green. Now notice, when we finish line five from the perspective of green, we're gonna do this assignment and we finish, we're gonna go to this line next, to line six, when we get back. We can't do that yet. Similarly, when we get back to blue, when we finish that assignment from the perspective of blue, then we'll go on to line six from the perspective of blue. But anyhow, right now we're at the green layer of the recursion, line five. We need to finish this recursive call before we can do that assignment. So we call reverse list, we send the address of this node, and then we'll call this one the gray layer. So we call it, we catch the parameter, that parameter is the address of this last node. And so from the perspective of gray, we have p head, it's the address of this last node. And we have this declaration p temp from the perspective of gray also. Okay. And then the base condition. If p head dot get p next is not equal to null. So p head dot get p next grabs this part right there. Now here it is in fact equal to null. And so this is true. And so we in fact return p head. Now here we go, we're about to start coming out of our layers of the recursion. When we return p head, it means from the perspective of gray, we're done. We don't do any more code from the perspective of gray because we have the return statement right there. Oh, why does it do that? So from the perspective of gray, we are returning, and we return back to the layer which is green. 
and from the perspective of green, what is the last thing that we had done? Well, for green, we had made the call for reverse list, and now um, we have a value. Because gray, at the gray layer, it said return p head, it's returning the address of the last node on the list. And so we take this last node on the list, we return it, and so now, from the perspective of green, we can complete this assignment. So the address of the last node of the list gets stored in the p temp from the perspective of green. So p temp gets the address of the last node on the list. That gets stored in a p temp. We now finish line 5 from the perspective of green. We go on to line 6 from the perspective of green. Line 6 says, so we're right here, line 6, p head dot get p next dot, oh, this whole long thing. Ah, remember this intuition that we looked at over here? We decided we didn't want to have to think about this when we got to this point. All it does is it reverses the link. It takes the address of the next node and makes it point back to me. So we're right here in green. It's going to take the address of the next node, which is that part, and make it point back to me. All right, so we already saw that. So now instead of null, this is going to have the address pointing back like that. That is what line 6 does from the perspective of green. And we get to line 7, it says return p temp. What is p temp? Well, p temp is the address of the last element on the list. So we return p temp from the perspective of green, which takes us back to the blue layer where we were at line 5. So we're now back at the blue layer at line 5. And now line 5, we can finish doing this assignment statement. And so what is the return value from reverse list? Well, that return value was the value stored in p temp which is the address of the last element of the list. So when we get that value, return value coming back out on line 5 from the perspective of blue, it stores into ptemp the address of the last element of the list. So now ptemp from the perspective of blue also points to the last element on the list. So now we finish line 5 from the perspective of blue. So we go to line 6, and line 6, as we saw already, it says, Make, take the next node and make it point to me. So this is from the perspective of blue from p head. Take the next node, which is this one, and make it point back to me. So what that's going to be is it's going to be that right there. So that's line 6 from the perspective of blue. Then line 7, return p temp. What is p temp? It's the address of the last node on the list. So we return p temp from the perspective of blue back out. Now that takes us all the way back out to the the black layer, the outermost layer. So at this outermost layer now, we're back here over here to line B. Outermost layer, we call that black. So now we have reverse list. We finish doing reverse list. And so for reverse list, we uh, can now do this assignment statement. The return value, when we return here from the perspective of blue, when we return p temp, we're returning that, which is the address of the last node on the list, and we're returning that back out to p head from the outermost layer's perspective, p head, that is, this p head. So we return the value of p temp back out, and that's used to change the value of p head. And what is that p temp that was re returned back? Well, it was the address of the last node of the list. So what that does is from the perspective of black, is p head now changes and it points to the last node on the list. So now we've finished line B, finally. And so now we can uh, we've changed the value of p head. Lastly, we come to line C, and line C says p temp dot set p next null. Okay, so p temp is this temporary pointer pointing to this node. And the reason we had to keep track of that is notice that there's no way to get to this now. P head is pointing to the beginning of the list over here. It's no longer pointing to this node. We'd have to traverse the list to get here, but the other problem is we still have this pointer right here that has to be set to null, and that's the purpose. We've got p temp right here, and this p temp, we say p temp dot set p next equals null. So p temp dot set p next takes the p temp pointer goes into it to this portion of it and sets this to be null so when we set that to be null 
this becomes null. And now we can go on and call display list and traverse the list, sending it the head pointer. So now when we traverse the list, the head of the list points here, so the first thing to be printed out would be the 1, then we follow this link, the next thing to be printed is the 3, then we follow this link, the next thing to be printed is the 5, and then we've got the null at the end of the list, so then we stop traversing the list. And we're done. Let's say we want to reverse a list, but we want to do it iteratively. So given this sample list that we have right here, with 7, then a 5, then a 3, and then a null, we want to reverse that list so that the list ends up looking like this list down here, where uh, the what used to be the end of the list is now the first node on the list, and what used to be the tail of the list, I'm sorry, what used to be the head of the list, now becomes the tail of the list, like that. So, um, doing it recursively can seem tricky, but doing it if iteratively can be tricky as well. Let's try and keep track of, of these pointers as we go. So, uh, and leave us a little bit of extra space here. So, we have to keep track of the previous node, the current node, and the next node. So, we have three pointers that essentially traverse the list. So the calling code in the main part of the program is we call reverse list, we send it the head of the list, and whatever the return value from this whole thing is going to become the new head of the list. Now what used to be the tail of the list is going to be the return value. So let's come up here and watch what happens. So we start in line 1, previous equals null, so that is going to be null right there. And then line 2, current equals head, so current points to the head of the list. Let's try this again. Current points to the head of the list. In other words, what's stored in here and p head is going to be copied into there. And then line 3, p next equals null. So this one points to nothing. And now here goes our loop. So starting in line 4, while current is not equal to null, well that's true, current is not equal to null, it points to a node. So uh, we do line 5. So next equals current get p next. So in other words, we advance, we, we make this point to the next one. So this point points to the current one, this points to the next one. So make this point to the next one, so this ends up pointing right here. It doesn't point to null anymore. Line 6, current dot set p next to be previous. So line 6 is the key. Line 6 says take the current pointer which is this node right here, go to the next one after that, and, uh, and uh, sorry, it says go to the current point, go to the current node, which is that one right here, and make its next pointer point to whatever this thing points to. Okay, So currently this points to null, so what's going to happen is this gets changed to null as well, so that gets erased and it becomes null like that. That was line 6. Then line 7, previous equals p current, okay, so previous, which is currently null, equals current, which is this. So previous equals current, so previous was null, and now it's not just going to point there. And uh, line 8, current equals next. So current used to point to this node is now going to get this value, which is the address of this node. So current is equal to next is going to end up looking like this. So at the end of each step, we get current and next pointing to the same place. At the beginning of each iteration, we advance next. So we come back through again in our while loop down here. While well, current is not null. Is it null? No, because it has the address of that node in it. <coughs> so line 5 advance the next pointer to be the next one. So instead of pointing there, it's now going to point there. Line 6, current.set next. So this is when we're reversing the pointer. So we get the trailing pointer, which is previous, and we're going to take the current pointer and make it point to whatever that points to. Okay. So line 6, set p next to be what's in previous. So instead of pointing to the next node, it's now going to point to what is in previous, which is the, the address of this node. 
And then line 7, previous equals current. So previous used to be the address of that. Current has the address of this node in it, which is what we're going to copy in here. So previous equals current, goes like that. And lastly, line 8, current equals next. So current equals next, like that. <coughs> and we cycle back around. Is this true? Is current equal to null? No. But we can see that next iteration it will be. So we do it one last time. So next equals current. So we advance. Whatever is in here is going to get stored into next. And that's null. So once again, we have null inside of p next. And then line 6, current dot set p next to be previous. And that what that does is it sets set this thing to be whatever is in previous, right? This is where we're doing the reversing a little bit. <clears throat> and so what happens is instead of that being null, points like that. Um, p current set p next to be previous, okay? And then line 7, p previous equals current. So we advance previous to be current, like that. And line 8, current equals next. So what's in next? It's null. So what do we put in current? Null. And we've got this. And we come back up to our loop and see, well, current is not equal to null. Well, now it is equal to null, so now we're done. So last thing that we have to do is we have to return the previous. So that is the pointer to the new head of the list, which then goes on, and this is now the new tail of the list. So this p head up here was the original parameter that came in, but we're returning the value, and the return value is this address, which is the address of the last node on the list, which is the new head of the list. And when we return that value down here, that value gets stored into p head, and so the last node of the list becomes the new head of the list. Fun, huh? <clears throat>